Okay, so let's get started. Um, so today, uh, welcome. First of all, welcome to uh, tonight's uh, CFA Tech 2020 Level One Information Seminar, and I am I am one of the trainers of, of uh, Kaplan today. Uh, my name is James, and um, today I will run uh, this seminar together with my uh, colleague uh, Christy, and she will be responsible for. Um, all the logistics and the course enrollment uh, issues, and to, tonight I will uh, go through what sort of things that you need to pay attention for the exam, as well as uh, to have a short demo lecture so that you can have a taste of um, how we conduct lectures uh, in our education program, as well as uh, our revision course. Uh, for this, uh, for you to prepare the um, uh, upcoming December 2020 CFA Level 1 exam. Okay? So, let me just give you a little bit of background of myself. And um, I have been in the industry since uh, two, year 2007, after, right after my uh, bachelor degree. And um, I have been working in both uh, sell side and buy side. Uh, for the past slightly more than a decade, and I've been in the, in the industry for ever since. And my um, I have been focusing on asset management field as well as uh, derivatives for the past uh, twelve years. And uh, right now, I'm working in a family office um, in, of course, in Hong Kong. And uh, I have been trained. Uh, Conducting training programs um, for CFA Level One since last year, and uh, this co um, cohort is my third um, cohort for the for the Level One program. And so, uh, let's walk through today's ag uh, agenda. And basically, the first part of today tonight's seminar is to give you a brief picture on the CFA program as well as what um, sort of career opportunities that CFA can lend you to. And the second part um, will be the demo lecture and we will use one of the topics in the program to show you how we conduct lectures today. And the last bit of it would be the offerings by Kaplan and basically what sort of uh, packages that we are offering and Kaplan for the CFA training course. So first we would uh, have a quick overview on what CFA program is as well as the current market condition and the demand for um, CFA, charter po CFA charter holders. So um, that, as you can see, basically the top employers for CFA charter holders are major financial institutes. Um, most of them, most of them are global banks, uh, and I guess you should be quite familiar with the names here. And basically, these financial institutions hire the most number of CFAs, uh, both locally and globally. And then uh, the second part of it. Um, is to dis to show you how uh, what sort of um, players are there in in the current financial market and where the CFA lends to. In most cases, uh, CFA charter holders are in either buy side or sell side um, as a role of analysts or portfolio managers. But um, this slide shows you a list of roles that CFA charter, hold, charter holders um, land into. And it should be note, noted that uh, although most CFA charter holders work in the field of finance, or at least in financial institutions, some of them do look, uh, work in other corporates, uh, but most of them um, serve as a role that re that's related to finance or investment. Say for example, some of the chart holders work in uh, listed companies or uh, other private companies as their uh, corporate finance officer. 
as well as some senior roles in uh, finance. Okay, so um, as you can see, most mid to senior posts uh, we are looking for CFA charter holders as or they are looking for ca uh, CFA candidates. And basically, uh, what here shows you is that the charter holder status is sort of a prerequisite for you to pursue a mid to senior career because it shows your potential employer your commitment to the industry. And it also shows your employer that you don't need to be trained in terms of knowledge in finance. And one thing that um, you should notice is that um, not only the investment roles requires um, you to have CFA charter holder status, but also other fields are starting looking for CFA charter holders. So basically, the exam itself is a proof um, for your potential employers that you have acquired sufficient knowledge in the field of investment and finance, and it serves as a pathway for you to land into roles that is related to finance. So, um, as you can see, here uh, CFA Institute summarized uh, some basic stats on um, the candidate's profile, and you can see uh, the exams are taught, like the exam targets uh, mostly um, full time or part time employees. But these two categories account for most of the uh, candidate profiles, and as you can see, um, most of the candidates work as research analysts as well as um, consultants, as well as uh, financial analysts. So as you can see, that the, the exam equips candidates to have sufficient knowledge to, uh, to satisfy these roles. OK, so let's move on to talk about what CFA is. OK. So, um, well, although the name CFA has a word charter, uh, it does not need to any so-called so charter status or um, other like other professional qualifications, such as uh, charter accountant or exact or something like that. But um, you don't need to have a CFA to practice in the finance industry, or else uh, I come. Uh, get into the field before getting the charter holder status. But um, the program itself is a well-structured and sophisticated program uh, which tests you the knowledge required to get into the investment field. Okay, So it is a knowledge-based exam or a knowledge-based qualification. So unlike other programs, it is not a knowledge slash skill, uh, soft skill based um, program, but it is purely on testing you, your knowledge in the field of investment and portfolio management. Okay? And you, as you can see, right now there are around uh, slightly over 142,000 chart holders worldwide. And to give you some interesting figures, um, so there are around approximately 7,500 chart holders in town, and which actually is the most uh, number of chart holders in Asia. So say, to give you some more uh, stats, so in, say, in in China mainland, Chinese mainland. So the number of candidates, uh, sorry, card holders are around three to 4,000 as of um, year 2019. And the number of chart holders in Taiwan is around 400 to 450. So you can see that um, actually, um, 
this city has quite a lot of charter holders compared to other uh, economies in Asia and also worldwide. Well, which is fair because um, the city is like renowned as a global financial center. Okay, so and then uh, the second point that I wish to um, talk about is that the program consists of three exams. So as you may or may not be aware, uh, so this is the level one seminar. So this is the first level of exam, and then you have to pass three levels of exams in order to fulfill the uh, prerequisite to be a charter holder. So the three exams have to be taken in sequence. So basically, you have to pass level one before taking level two. And of course, you have to pass level two to take level three. But um, there are no limits on the number of attempts. Okay, and there, there is no time limits for you to um, satisfy these three ex like, satisfy the requirements for these three exams. So basically, you can do as many times as you like, and you can attempt the exam as long as you like. But uh, one more thing: um, the curriculum changes annually to make sure that the curriculum is uh, reflect the latest changes in the in the area of finance. And the process will be done by uh, CFA Institute, and they, they will revise the curriculum uh, annually. Having said that, um, the curriculum of December 2020 will be the same, will, will, will be used in the year 2021 because of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So this is like a special arrangement. Otherwise, the curriculum will, will change. Um, in the year 2021. Okay, so here is summarized the entry requirement for uh, to get enrolled into CFA program. So as long as you satisfy one of these three requirements, then you can um, get yourself enrolled as a candidate for the CFA level one. Uh, and here, you should notice that um, the CFA Institute does not require you to have four years of full-time working experience in the field of finance to get involved, to, to get yourself enrolled in the program. Um, as long as you satisfy one of these three, then you're okay. And the um, and questions like, oh, do they do they look at my uh, major or like do I have to be um, graduated with a business degree or a, a degree in finance? No. Any bachelor's degrees are okay. 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 So, and as I've said before, so passing three levels of exam are one of the requirements that you need to become a charter holder. And then there are two more, uh, actually three more, um, requirements. Uh, the second one is uh, you need to have uh, four years of uh, relevant work experience. So this term, relevant, can be interpreted um, in a quite a, in quite a loose way. So um, the way they put it is you have it has to be relevant to the investment field, but um, it is a self-declaration process. So you need to write um, a statement to the CFA Institute to show that you have the sufficient uh, work experience uh, when you have passed the three levels of exam. So I don't think you need to worry too much about it at, the, at this point. Um, what should concern you is whether you can pass the three levels, of, three levels of exam, okay? And then the third requirement is to have two CFA chart holders to, sponsor, um, to sign off a sponsor statement for you. And I don't think that is also a big issue, given that 
there are quite a number of um, safety shuttles in town. And of course, uh, in order to be a shuttle status and use um, and put it in your name card, you have to pay membership fee, a very important thing. Paying fees are very important. Or else you cannot use uh, the charter holder status in your name card. Okay, anyways. Um, so right now, uh, as we have said, uh, that um, there are three levels of exam. And what concerns you the most right now is level one here. And what is more, the most important part for level one exam is volume. Okay, so of course um, you may have seen uh, advertisements or you have heard from your friends or whatever that uh, the CFA Institute recommends uh, 300 hours of study for each level of the exam. So uh, then you can imagine that um, the volume of uh, knowledge that they are looking for is quite, quite a lot. And you can see basically what they expect is the white books over there. So every candidate um, get enrolled into level one would have a soft copy of the six books over there, okay, the white one. Oh, of course, if you want to have a hard copy, then you need to pay an extra fee, uh, but they will send you the soft copy anyway. So basically, everything will, like, things that will be tested in the exam are all contained there. But, um, if you get enrolled in our program, then we are talking about uh, slide packs like the one sitting uh, next to them. And uh, you, and those slide packs are more like more of a, like a study guide and a condensed version of the official, uh, official textbooks for the exam. But anyways, um, it is a challenge in terms of um, volume and then and they expect um, candidates who can pass the exam to have sufficient knowledge on most if not all uh, the topics included in the curriculum okay so as I've as I've said uh, volume is the thing okay so and then the next thing is to talk about what you are going to be test because this is a knowledge based exam. So you can see there are 10 topic areas in all of the three levels. Um, so in level one, you can see that ethics and professional standards and financial reportings carry the most weight. Uh, each of them carry, um, carries 15%. And then the rest of the topics would have around 10%-ish, but it is a broad range of topics that you need to um, master. And um, of course, different topics carry different weight, but then they will follow um, this guideline strictly when they, um, when they set questions in the exam. So say if you see that quantitative methods carry 10%, then you should expect that you will have 10% um, of content um, tests from, taken from the quantitative methods. Okay, so the next one talks about the exam format for the level one exam. And you have one day to take the exam, and which is broken down into two sections, the morning section and the afternoon section. So three hours each, and you will need to answer 240 multiple choice questions. And of course, uh, one um, common or free FAQ of CFA exam is, okay, can I find past papers? The answer is again, no. They, the CFA Institute does not publish any past paper on their website. And technically speaking, if anyone tells you that they have the past paper um, 
probably I'm not commenting on the validity of uh, whether it is true or not, but uh, it is likely that um, those are not past previous problems. But of course, um, having some training on those problems that takes no harm if you have extra time. And there are no um, essay or short answer questions in the exam, only multiple choice questions. So you have to answer 240 multiple choice questions in two sections. So, uh, which means you uh, have one and a half minutes for each question because you can expect that you, ha you have 180 hours in one section to answer 120 uh, multiple choice. And then you will, one more thing that you should uh, be aware is that uh, both morning and the afternoon section cover all topics. So if you're in the exam, say, um, sitting the exam in the morning and then you see quantitative methods coming up, then you should expect that quantitative methods will also come up in the afternoon section. And then they will distribute the questions evenly. So 10% of the 120 questions will test you the knowledge in quantitative method in the morning as well as afternoon. Say for example, okay? This uh, may or may not concern you uh, if you have enrolled into the DEC 2020 exam. Uh, and if, well, obviously, um, I wish you all to pass the exam if you have enrolled. But uh, for those who have not decided yet whether they are going to take the exam or not, then this change may, um, may be of your concern because um, the CFA Institute um, is going to change um, the level one exam from paper-based exam to computer-based exam starting from 2021. And there are two more changes. One, they are running for exams a year starting from 2021. The second change is instead of uh, answering 240 multiple choice questions, the number of questions will be reduced to 180 questions starting from 2021. But you will have less time to answer them. So. Um, the standard remains unchanged, so you still have one and a half minute to answer one question on average, but you are going to answer fewer questions um, starting from 2021. And one more thing that may concern you is that if you, en if you enroll in the February exam, then you cannot enrolled into the May exam. So if you, of course, if you pass the February exam, then fine. You, you, can, you can move on to, uh, and take level two. But then if you unfortunately did not go uh, past the February exam, then you cannot take the May exam, but you have to take the August exam. Okay, so you have to wait at least six months to make a second attempt. Okay, so this is the, le uh, the latest update for the level one exam uh, starting from 2021. Okay, so obviously this is the fastest track that you can uh, pursue to get the chart order status. So technically speaking, um, you can pass all three levels in 18 months. Okay, so you start the level one in deck 2020, and then you pass the exam and you take the June 2021 level two exam, and then in 2022 you take level three. So that's the shortest uh, duration to pass all the three exam. Um, if you take them in sequence and you pass all of them in one of them. Okay, this should be something that concerns all of you, is the passing rate. Okay, you can see that um, two things you can see observed from the table. 
First, the passing rate is roughly uh, constant. So you can see it's around 42 to 45 percent, 42, 44, 43, etc. So um, they managed to control the passing rate at around anywhere between 40 to 45 percent. Uh, that's the first thing. The second thing is that you see the passing, the passing rate increases with the level, but then, oh, wow. Um, this is a classic, as I put it, it's called survivorship bias, okay? So you, for those who can survive in level one, then you do level two. For those who can survive in level two, then you, you take level three. Uh, that's why the passing rates are higher, because um, you can only do the exam in sequence, okay? And then another thing that um, that you like, I guess everyone is interested is, is the um, so-called the cutoff. Okay. Um, so there are a lot of uh, sitting myths or rumors uh, about the passing score of um, CFA exam. So basically, the cutoff is seventy percent. Okay, but there is a but. Okay. Um, here, a CFA Institute has never officially published a hard cutoff line on their passing score, okay? Which means, uh, if you come to me and say, hey, look, um, I get 68%, uh, can I pass? Then my answer to you is, I'm not sure. Because um, usually the cutoff is slightly lower than 70% in practice, okay? So they made a statement saying that if you have achieved 70% or above, then they will never fail you. They won't fail you if you, you, you score 70% or higher, okay? But what if you score slightly lower than 70%? So then the question is, they will look at your grades in ethics to see if um, you achieve more than 70% in ethics, basically. So say if someone achieves 68% and, uh, uh, and he's, he or she scored, say, 80% in ethics sections, then it's quite likely that the guy will, like the person will pass the exam. Or, um, or if someone uh, achieve, like score 68%, but then the person score like 50 or 40% in the ethics sections, then I really wonder whether that guy can pass the exam. So that's, that's how the game works, okay? Okay, again, uh, I don't mean like the numbers here, list here, on, do, not serve as, do not serve as an intention to uh, scare you off. Okay, but yes, so you have uh, 530 uh, learning outcome statements, we call the LOS, um, in the exam, and you have, okay, more than well, around 3,000 pages of reading. So basically it's referred to the, to the white book there, okay? But if you look at the study guide, then you... Um, study guide or the slide pack, then um, it is condensed to slightly to, like it's, it's condensed significantly, I should say, um, to around 1,000 to 1,500 1, pages. So it's like condensed to half. So, um, and for most candidates, it's sufficient to pass the exam uh, by focusing on the study guide, if you are actually uh, working full time, because that's a more a more practical uh, approach for the exam. Unless you are a perfectionist, so like you want to score hundred percent, or like oh yeah, I want to score eighty five percent of the exam, but um, that doesn't carry too much, okay? Okay, so here um, it shows you about our approach to help you to prepare for the exam. 
So we broke, we break down the uh, course into three parts. So first part is uh, what we call the education program. So this phase is for those um, who have need to background uh, in in finance or um, they have some knowledge in some topic areas, but they don't have much knowledge on the others. Then we will also recommend you to join the education program because this part is mainly um, conducted in lecture mode. So we would go through all the LOS um, available in the curriculum and we will explain the concepts uh, as if you have no uh, previous knowledge on. And then the revision course will be the next stage and we would um, go through some uh, questions from the question bank that uh, is prepared by Kaplan. And we would highlight some techniques that you need to um, quickly find the correct answer um, from the from the material like from the question, and then the last phrase is the mock exam. So basically, you will be sitting um, as a real exam setting. So you will do a mock exam um, as if you are doing the real exam. So three hours and three hours, and then we will walk through with you um, some common mistakes that you make, like as well as other candidates in a debrief section after the mock exam. So that's um, the three phrases that we um, will help you to prepare for the upcoming exam. Okay, so, and then you can see that um, by enrolling into, the pro and into Kaplan's program, you will have um, slide packs, as well as um, the Swiser notes for the exam, instead of looking at the, like, the official textbooks, so which greatly con condense the, um, the material into useful or, or need-to-know information for you to prepare the exam. And um, apart from the, Schweizer, the hard copies of the Schweizer notes, uh, in the package we will also have uh, online progress tests that you can update yourself. Um, your knowledge and test yourself whether you have sufficient uh, time to finish all the questions um, as if you need to do it in the real exam okay so so, as, as, so here it just um, talks you about the phase two of the program and as I have said so phase two is for you to um, walk through some tricky questions and we would show you like our trainers will show you how to approach these tricky questions with um, some special techniques and then the last stage is a more exam okay so that ends the first part of the today's seminar so if you have any questions then oh, okay of course you can um, Feel free to raise any questions now or after the demo lecture. Um, and then we will have a short demo lecture to show you how our education program runs. Um, and then after the short demo lecture, I will invite um, my colleague Christy to walk you through about the logistics and then the um, packages that Kaplan is offering right now for um, for the level one program. Okay. <coughs> okay. So before moving to the um, to the demo lecture, we will first show you how our slide pack is arranged. So basically, as our slide pack is prepared in the format of um, like a PowerPoint style slides and uh, you can find the LOS on each slide so that you can easily make reference to uh, to both of to, to your study guide as well as of course the official
quote unquote textbooks. Okay? <clears throat> so these are the like the common features that we can we, we have for our slice pack in the education program. And then for uh for the revision course, we will also have uh, a mind map uh, that collects uh, that summarize the necessary knowledge that you need to know for for that particular LOS. Okay. <coughs> Sorry. So to so today we will move on to um, one of the um, topic areas um, in this demo lecture. We will pick a where uh, we pick a we pick a one LOS in uh, quantity methods to show you how the lectures in education program is run. So today's um, demo lecture will focus on um, introducing to you some basic probability concepts. So as you can see, these are basically our real slides that you will find in our slide pack. So first, when we talk about probability, so we would need to first understand um, some terms. Okay. Um, well, to clarify that uh, in quantity methods, CFA program does not always ask you to memorize the formula or to ask you to um, do a lot of calculations. So many of those problems in all topic in each of these topic areas will focus you we focus on the understanding of the topics that is they don't require you to do very complex calculations but they want you to understand the concepts behind those um, theories okay so understanding the terms and um, the theories are quite important for you to master or to score good in the in the uh, in the exam, so having said that, we will go through some basic terminologies uh, in the area of probability. So, uh, in particular, we would talk about um, we we'll first introduce um, five key terms that in probability. First one is uh, what we call the random variable, and which is basically a number that describes an event. Um, we will use Say, and we do not have uh, any idea about the outcome. So that's what we call uncertain. So, say for example, uh, when we talk about the return of, say, HSBC, uh, this is random because we do not know the return of the stock until we obs um, until the market close. So, say today, say today's morning, I don't know the return of uh, HSBC, and. I only know the return until the market closes. Okay, so that tells you how um, how we define random variable. And then the next term we need to focus is the outcome. So as I've mentioned in our previous example, that uh, the return of HSBC is a random variable. But then once we have uh, we have the market close, then we know the outcome. Of the return of the daily return of uh, HSBC. Say, say if today the market goes up, and the stock of HSBC goes up as well. So we know, okay, say, um, HSBC goes up today. And then the next term that we need to focus, uh, we need to define is um, what we call event. So, using the example of HSBC, so we def we can define our events. Say. We define that we define the return of HSBC. Say, say we define three events. Say less than return less than negative one percent between zero to one percent or greater than one percent. So we break down the um, returns into three different events or three different outcomes, and we call these collections of outcomes events. Okay, and then which makes and once we have defined the term event, then we can say, uh, we can make statements on 
or we can make um, classifications on different events and two particular events are of our interest. The first one is what we call mutually exclusive event, which means both of them uh, cannot happen at the same time. So using our HSBC example, say um, we define the event A as HSBC returns um, less than negative 1%. And then we define event B as HSBC returns more than 1%, say these two events. So we know that it is not possible that these two events happen on the same day. So either, so if HSBC returns more than 1%, then it is not possible that it returns less than negative 1%. So it drops more than 1%, in other words. So both of the, like, we can only have one but not the other. So that's how we define mutually exclusive events. And the second event that we need to know is what we call exhaustive events. Okay. Exhaustive events is a collection of events that lists out all the possible outcomes. So you see here, say, uh, we keep on using this HSBC example. So... We have defined event A as um, the daily return of HSBC less than negative uh, 1%, that, and B as the HSBC re returning more than 1%. But these two are not exclusive events because we have missed out the possibility that HSBC gives a return between negative 1% and 1%. So what if? Um, HSBC does not, did not rise or drop compared to yesterday, okay? So if we include this event as well, then all these re events, we define them as exhaustive events because it includes all the, all the possible outcomes in, uh, in the list of events here, list out here, okay? And then, uh, when we learn probability, we, uh, we need to be aware that the probability of any given event should be between 0 and 1. It, like, if a probability of an, any given event is 0, then that means it is impossible to happen. And if the probability is equal to 1, then it is sure that some, the event happens. That's the first property of probability that you need to be aware. Okay, so how do we apply this probability? Like, how do we apply this knowledge? Which means, if I tell you that the probability of something is negative, then it, you will tell, "Oh, this is not possible." Say, if I tell you that I have negative two hundred percent of chance that. Um, HSBC goes negative today, then you say, oh, this is a false statement because probability is not going to be negative. And another thing that you need to know is um, the sum of all events should be equal to 1. So if you add up all these probabilities, then they should be equal to 100%. So it won't be greater than 100%. It won't be less than 100%, but it has to be 100%. Say, HSBC can either go up, go flat, set, that means unchanged, or go down. And all these three events should, the probability of all these three events should add up to 100%. Okay? And then the next part of uh, probability that you that is required in level one exam is um, how we find out these probabilities. So we have three ways to determine the probability of any of an event. First is empirical, which means we collect a set of data. Say I collect um, the daily returns of um, HSBC for the past 200 trading days. 
And then I found out that, say, from 220 trading days, we have 70, 70 days go down, 70 days go up, and then 60 days unchanged. We say the probability of uh, HSBC going down is 70 out of 200. So that's how we define empirical probability, uh, which means we take past data to find out the probability. And the second one is subjective probability, which means um, it, the probability is assigned by, your, by, your, by you. Okay, say, you can say that probability that HSBC goes up tomorrow is 99% because I believe that. Okay, that's what we call subjective probability. You ca this one cannot be test, it's just your perception. And um, the last one is the so-called Pirori probability. This one is a bit more tricky because that's based on um, some mathematical reasoning. Okay, so taking a look at the stock return does not have any mathematical reasoning, but if I flip a coin or I roll a dice, then there is a probability, there is a reasoning. Okay, so if I flip a coin, so either it can be head or tail. Okay, so we know that if the coin is fair, uh, we know that um, the chance of getting a head is half, and the chance of getting a tail is also half. So this is something that we know in advance it, with theory. We call these probabilities a priori probability. Okay. Okay. So before we end this uh, demo lecture, we will have one last bit to talk about um, to cover here today. Um, so the first, this concept is important um, when we look at um, investment. Uh, the concept is called for or against. So it's pretty much the jargon used in casinos, okay? So, um, say we know that um, there is 20% of chance that a horse can win a race, and if you bet the horse to win, then the odds for you, we call it odds for, is basically your win chance over the chance of losing. So we call it one to four. So you have one out of, so you, if you win once, then you will lose four times in this game, okay? So 20 to 80, right? So odd against is basically the, the reciprocal of odd four. Lose to win ratio. We call it four to one. So you lose four times, then you have a chance to, like, do you have uh, around uh, one time that you win in the game. So of course, uh, given the time constraint here, so of course we have prepared quite a bit of uh, concepts um, to talk about tonight, but I guess uh, it's better for to have uh, my colleague Christy to introduce to you um, the logistics of the program like, and the course administration part of the program. Okay?